How many of you here, like, have you ever had brown rice? Because most Filipinos, you know, they, they don't like brown rice, right? They like white rice. White rice tastes better. My, my wife, Candice, she likes white rice. I like brown rice. But do you know why I like brown rice? My mom gave it to me ever since I was a kid. So when I eat white rice, I'm like, that just doesn't taste right. But when Candace eats brown rice, she's oh, what is this stuff? <laughs> like, we're both opposite, you know? So at home, what we have to do is we have to cook brown rice with white rice. We have, we have a mix, yeah. right? The reason why I like brown rice was because I was used to it growing up. The reason why she likes white rice Growing up, she was used to it. If you are accustomed and you train yourself to eat something, you will end up liking it. And for those of you who think that the Bible is boring, it's because you're used to garbage. Stop eating the garbage. Okay, so we see here again that God wants to give us wisdom through his word, through his scripture, but we first have to stop eating garbage. Now, I want to, you to see this. There's a quote that I have. Ellen White says this, and we need to seek to evangelize. Once we, once we begin to grow in Christ, once we know what the gospel is, we need to know how to teach others, okay? And so the, the first thing we should do is to evangelize. Now, there's a quote here, it's a phenomenal quote, and I'm gonna get to it, just skip down. It's right here, okay. I'm going to read this once, then I want you to, to really look at it and read it. Notice what it says in Last Day Events, page 282. There will be no one saved in heaven with a what? Starless crown. Okay? Listen to this. It's fascinating. If you enter into heaven... There will be some soul in the courts of glory that has found an entrance there through your what? Woo! Did you guys see that? If you make it to heaven, Brian, Edwin, if you make it to heaven, anyone in this room, if you make it to heaven, when you make it to heaven, what God is going to do is he's going to get a crown and he's going to place it on your head. You're going to look at that crown... And you're going to realize that the many stars you have on there represents the souls you won to the kingdom. Now, check this out. If you have not won a soul to Christ, what are the chances of you making it into heaven? Someone said the right answer. Zero percent. The only way to make it to heaven is through winning a soul. Now let me re repeat that. It's almost as if God make it made it a requirement. A what everyone? Requirement. requirement. Now what does it mean? What does a requirement mean? In order for you to come here to AUP, in order for you to go to college, did you have requirements? Yes. yes. What is some of the requirements? Take a test, an entrance test. Maybe some of you had to buy a uniform, right? Maybe you had to enroll in classes. Maybe another requirement was you had to pay registration. Is that right? Are all of these things requirements in order to make it into college? Yes. Now, it's as if God said, look, Edwin. Look, Alvin. In order for you to make it to heaven, you must accept Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. You go, okay, I've done that. Check. Okay, the next thing I need you to do is I need you to follow my commandments. Okay? Check. The next thing after that is God wants you to win at least one soul into his kingdom. So, does that make sense? You need to be able to check that one off. Because according to this quote... There will be no one saved in heaven with a starless crown. Imagine how wonderful it's going to be. You, you just made it to heaven. You go into heaven and, and, and there's, they say there's going to be three surprises in heaven. Number one, you're going to be there. Oh, I made it. Praise God, right? Number two, 
Those who you never thought would make it, the most vile, sinful, criminals, all those guys, the most, the people who you thought would never have a chance to make it, some of them will make it. The next surprise in heaven is this, the people who you thought were sure to make it, man, this person was so holy, they read their Bible every day, man, this person, they are always preaching a sermon, some of those people will not make it. Three surprises in heaven. You'll be there, because obviously you'll be like, oh, I made it. Someone else didn't make it who you thought you'd be there. And someone you know who was the most despicable person will be there. I'll give you an example. Does anyone know the prophet Isaiah? Yeah? Prophet Isaiah? Does anyone know how the prophet Isaiah died? Who here knows their Bible trivia? How did Isaiah die? Does anyone know? Okay, you got it, Ryan? Yeah? Yeah, King Manasseh did what? He killed him. How did King Manasseh kill Isaiah? Does anyone know? Painful way to die. Sodom in half. So imagine, instead of you being hung, instead of someone shooting you, instead of someone giving you lethal injection, I get a saw. You know, a saw it has a lot of rigid parts, you know? And I start just sawing you. That's, that's how, this is how he dies. Now, the person who killed Isaiah is King Manasseh. Now, imagine, imagine Isaiah, he's about to die. And the person who has killed him is Manasseh. He's like sawing him in half. I want you to die, Isaiah. Now, here's the crazy part. Years later, do you know what happens to Manasseh? He gives his heart to Jesus. He becomes converted. In other words, he's going to make it to heaven. Do you know how interesting it's going to be in heaven when you see Isaiah and Manasseh in heaven? Isaiah's going to... Oh, he makes it there, you know, he's like, he gets there. And he's looking around for his friends. Y'all want to see where Jeremiah is. I want to see where Ezekiel is. I want to see where all my boys are, you know, all my prophets. And then he's looking for them. And then he goes and he sees, whoa, what are you doing here? <laughs> You're the guy who killed me. <laughs> what happened to you? Now, praise the Lord that he's not going to be like, hey, God, we need to have a talk here. I know some stuff about him. You will not believe what he did to me. You know, Isaiah's not going to have that spirit. He's going to be, praise the Lord. How did you make it? What happened? And Manasseh will be like, hey, Isaiah, I'm really sorry. That was my bad. <laughs> Please forgive me. I was unconverted. I didn't know about the grace of God and, you know, after you died and, you know, someone came along and I read through the, the story of Genesis and I, I saw the story of the Messiah and that made me, my heart melt and I realized that I had done something wrong and so I, I decided to live my life for God. And Isaiah's going to be like, praise the Lord, I'm glad you're here. I got this scar from you though, you know. <laughs> All right, so... Those are the three surprises in heaven. This idea of someone being able to make it. And I want you to look at that. When you look at this idea of heaven, remember, this idea of soul winning is not optional. It's not what? It is a requirement. Now, let me encourage you that soul winning is done through a number of ways. The way that you live your life. It's done through different ways. Now, let me give you three methods of soul winning. Go in your Bibles to Luke chapter 8, verse 38 and 39. Three examples of soul winning. For those of you who say, I can't preach well, and I don't know my Bible well, let me give you three ways that you can win souls to Christ. Okay? Three ways. We'll, we'll cover these three ways. And then we're going to wrap this session up, have a short break, and then begin. All right, so here are the three ways. Those of you who are saying, I can't preach well, it's okay. I'll give you three methods. Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 38 and 39. Three methods of evangelism. Remember, we're talking about evangelism here.
Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 38. Okay. Before I read that text, what is the story in Luke chapter 8? Who is it about? Does anyone know? Who's Luke chapter 8 about? The demoniacs, right? This guy who was unconverted, he lived his life for Satan, he became, he became into the world, and obviously we know that he was chained up and the chains couldn't hold him down. Jesus comes onto this island of the Galdeans, and we know that this guy approaches him, and then, and then there are legions of demons in him. Jesus casts the demons out, they go to the pigs, the pigs run off the cliff, and then the demon who was naked, he becomes fully clothed. Okay? Luke chapter 8, verse 38. And this man, actually let's start in verse 37. Go to verse 37 first. It says, Then the whole multitude of the country of the Gadarenes, everyone else who lived on this island, they went about and they besought Jesus to depart from them, for they were taken with great fear, and he went up into the ship and he returned back again. So, all these people, they saw that this unconverted man, this demoniac, that once who was blind now sees, one who was lost is now found, this guy who they should have been rejoicing, they see that he is now converted, and they look at him and they go to Jesus and they say, Jesus, we want you out of here. You see, when you become converted, that's not a popular thing. The rest of the world won't like you. Your family may even think that you're weird. You may even be made fun of for your silly diet, a vegetarian diet, or if you were in a, uh, a place where you used to eat pork and shrimp, and you say, no, I can't eat that anymore. Okay? Notice what happens. Verse 38, now the man of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be, be with him, but Jesus sent him away. So here is this man, and he's demon-possessed. Then the demon leaves, and Jesus is leaving. Jesus is getting into the ship now. And before Jesus leaves, this demoniac goes up to Jesus and says, Wait! Jesus returns, looks back and says, Yes? Hey, 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 don't, don't leave me here. I don't want to be with these people. They don't like you, and they don't like me. They've never liked me. I don't want to be in this island. I'm going to be by myself. Jesus looks at him. And I thought that Jesus would say, no problem, come with me. Jesus doesn't do that. Notice what Jesus says. Verse 39. Jesus tells him, return to your own house and show how great things God had done unto you. And this man who doesn't know much of the Bible, what did he do? He went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto them. The first thing that you can do for soul winning and evangelizing is to publish, is media. Many of you say, I don't know my Bible enough. Do you have Facebook? Yeah? I bet you every person in this room has Facebook. I bet you if you don't have faith, not only do you have Facebook, I bet you you also have MySpace. I bet you that not only do you have MySpace, but you have Friendster. Not only do you have Friendster, but you probably have Multiply. Not only do you have Multiply, but you have some other social networking site. I don't know what the new one is here in the Philippines. You know, now, check this out. Not only do you have Friendster, MySpace, Facebook, Multiply, and is there another one? High Five? Twitter. I heard of Twitter. Oh, yeah, yeah. Can't forget Twitter. You probably now also have Skype. Yes. <laughs> you know, I didn't even know what Skype was until a couple months ago. Yeah, I just, I didn't, I never used it, never cared for it. Now, I bet you, you not only have Skype, but you also have Yahoo Instant Messenger. Am I right? 
Now, not only do you have Yahoo Instant Messenger, but some of you, especially if you have international friends, might even have Chica. Yeah? Am I right again? What in the world? That is a lot of different social networking sites. Now, not only do you have Yahoo Instant Messenger, not only do you have Twitter, not only do you have Skype, not only do you have Chica, not only do you have Facebook, Multiply, not only do you have Friendster, High Five, not only do you have MySpace, but I bet you also have email. Okay, wait, wait, wait. You have all those things? Now, now, I bet you not only do you have that, you probably also have one of these. Yeah? That is 11 different ways that you can communicate with people. Now, let me ask you a question. If I were to look at your Facebook page right now, would it tell me that you're a child of God? Or would it tell me that you're a child of the world? Would it tell me that on your, your status update it would say, I just saw the new Toy Story 3 movie. I just read the book Twilight. I just did this or I just did that. If I were to look at who you really are deep down, would I see that you're a child of God or a child of Satan? Because you are only, you're only controlled by one person, either God or Satan. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 6 and 7, you see the Sermon on the Mount, by their blank, you will know who they are. By their what? Fruits. By their fruits. Now here in the Philippines, you have good fruits. Mangosteen, mangoes, pineapples, papaya, lanzones, rambutan, marang. You have all these really good fruits that we don't have in the, in the States, right? But... I hope that the fruits that you have aren't just good fruits that you can eat. I hope the fruits that you have are internal. Because you share who Jesus is. So for those of you who are saying, I can never preach a sermon, you can at least post a Bible verse on your Facebook application. You can at least send a, a message to someone who you know is in trouble and say, you know what, God loves you, I have a Bible text for you. You have all of these networking sites, but how many of you actually use it to God's glory? Those things, Facebook, all that stuff, that's not bad. None of those things are bad in and of itself, okay? I'm not here to tell you, hey, delete that, get rid of that, no, 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 no. That stuff is fine. I have Facebook. But I use it for ministry. I use it to advance the cause of God. I've used it before to have a Bible study with someone. You know, on, on a Facebook chat. I'm here, say, open your Bible, I'm opening my Bible, I'm giving them a Bible text. I have friends, and on their status update, they're always giving an Ellen White quote. This man in Luke chapter 8, demoniac, he obviously didn't know his Bible very well, but we know that Jesus said to him, hey, I want you to go to your family and your friends. And he could have easily given the excuse, who am I? I don't know anything. I wasn't trained. I didn't go to a Bible college. I'm not a theology major. God doesn't care if you're a theology major or not. He wants you to witness for him in every aspect of your life. Does that make sense? Notice what happens. Notice that the result of this. Verse 40. After Jesus comes back, remember, Jesus was kicked out of the island. They wanted nothing to do with Jesus. The people there said, Jesus, leave. Now, we don't like you. Notice what happens next. Verse 40. And it came to pass that when Jesus was what? Returned, what happened? The people gladly received him. Why? For they were all waiting for him. Could you believe this, beloved? The entire island, let's just say that this is Mindoro Island, 
Let's just say this is Cebu Island. Let's just say this is Bohol. Let's just say that this is some island and everyone said, Jesus, get out of here. And then this man goes and he says, I don't know anything what to do. So I'm going to just get on Facebook. I'm going to get on Twitter. I'm going to get on Skype. I'm going to get on Chica. I'm going to get on Multiply. I'm going to get on every one of my networking sites and just tell them what Jesus did for me. This one story converted all the people. Not only did they want Jesus to return, it says that they were waiting for him. Wait, wait, wait. Let, let's, let's back up. Let's look at that one more time. How many were waiting for him? And it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting for him. Okay, we looked at John chapter 4 yesterday, so let's look at one more and we're going to close. Next one is Mark chapter 2, verse 14. Mark chapter 2, verse 14. Here's one more method of evangelism that I'm going to give you. Even if you don't know how to preach a sermon. Mark chapter 2, verse 14. Now, I bet you most of you in this room don't know how to give Bible studies on all 28 fundamentals, right? It's okay. That's fine. But do you know someone who can give a Bible study? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Do you know a pastor? Yes. Yes. That pastor can give a Bible study, right? Do you know a deacon and an elder? Yes. Yes. That person should be able to give a Bible study. I hope that especially if you're theology majors, you know how to give a Bible study. Because if you don't, you have no business being a theology major. Did you hear me? I'm talking to theology majors. If you're a theology major and you don't know how to defend the Sabbath, if you don't know how to defend the state of the dead, if you don't know how to defend what you believe, there is no reason why you should enter into the ministry. Now, let me share this story with you with Mark chapter 2. I like this story a lot because there was a time, let me tell you about a personal testimony. There was a time when I got converted that I didn't know my Bible. I didn't know where to find things. I didn't know the books of the Bible. If you said, hey, I want you to go to a book of Ruth, I'd be like, where in the world is Ruth? Right? I wouldn't know where Haggai is. I wouldn't know any of those things. So this is the type of person I was. Mark chapter 2, verse 14. And as he passed by, this is Jesus, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom, and said unto him, Follow me. And